So um, for those of you who have never seen the framework, this is what it looks like. Um, it's actually it's got five domains. Uh, it's not a two by two model. It's actually got five domains. Uh, very simply, if you look at the domains on the right, the clear and the complicated, those are what we refer to as the order domains. Um, what we re what we mean by order is simply that this is where you know um, cause and effect exist. So it's si simple in the clear domain. Um, you know, it's very easy to make sense of things, categorize and then respond to the problem. This is where best practice exists. Um, it, this is a place where, you know, you can apply rigid constraints uh, in the complicated domain. Um, this is where you can, if you have the right level of entrainment, you can actually make sense of the problem, analyze it in the right way and then respond. So um, good examples of a clear um, type of system is a uh, bicycle. So all of us have ridden bicycles as children, um, you know, th that feeling we are riding down the hill really quick and then suddenly, you know, the, the chain falls out. Nobody taught you how to fix the bicycle, but if you stare at it long enough, you kind of know how to fix it because the system is clear enough. A uh, complicated domain is, is somewhat like a um, Boeing 747. It's extremely complicated. It's a sophisticated um, machine, uh, but if you have the right entrainment, you can actually fix the problem. Um, the problem is having the right expertise. So in the audit domain, this is where, you know, systems are closed. Um, there are rigid or governing constraints. Um, you know, it's more of the mechanistic type systems that we're used to, very um, engineering type systems. And um, what we're starting to see more and more of now is that a lot of uh, systems that interact a lot with human systems, so software for development, for example, there are some components that are ordered, but um, you know, the, there are also components that are in perpetual beta, for example, and you're consistently having to interact with the user to actually get more user experience, user stories. Uh, we believe that a lot of things, particularly uh, systems which interact with human systems, tend to be complex in nature. So Cognovich represents a school of complexity that is called anthrocomplexity, um, which is slightly different than you know more computational schools of complexity. So we study specifically complexity um, as it exists in human systems. And we believe human systems are, you know, to a degree more complex than even uh, natural ecosystems because human beings have intelligence, intent, and if they know the system, they will try to game it. So how do we actually apply some levels of understanding um, to cope with that? Uh, in the complex domain, we believe that things are consistently emergent. So you have to apply constraints, but those constraints enable rather than restrict. Um, and we have to run many safe to fail experiments rather than focus on developing single solutions. Um, now, chaos is on the bottom left. Uh, we don't often dip into chaos because chaos is actually the complete absence of any constraints. It's completely novel situations. Um, it's very rare to find chaotic systems. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it, it, because a lot of, um, this science draws from, um, thermodynamics. So if you think about thermodynamics, uh, the, the way to actually effectively remove all constraints is to apply a massive amount of heat. The amount of energy it takes to remove all effective constraint is so high that it's very difficult to create and almost impossible to sustain particularly in human systems, because humans actually like order. In the absence of order, we will create it. Um, so the fifth domain, which is this one right in the middle, that's um, the domain where you are confused, you don't know what domain you're in, and therefore you don't know how to take the right action. Uh, a lot of people who experience Kinevin, they tend to experience it only at that first level that I've just described. Um, they use it to categorize problems, make sense of things, and then, okay, so this is, you know, the nature or the context of my problem, and this is how I have to act within it. But um, there is actually another level to Kinevin, which is how do you actually take action? How do you transition across domains? How do you make use of the framework to actually stimulate things like innovation? How do you actually continuously scan, incubate, and explore? Which is what that um, green sort of line in the framework represents. That is what we refer to as the liminal 
line. The liminal line in um, Kinevin is deliberate. Um, and I'll talk you through a few examples. I thought that a useful case study would actually be to talk about COVID. Since it is a shared context, um, fortunately on, or unfortunately, that we all share at the moment. Um, so I'm going to sort of situate it in Singapore, where I'm dialing in from. Um, it is my home country. So, uh, you know, we have, I think, um, done reasonably well, but there have been some problems with how we have handled it in so far. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, a lot of the things that we've actually done well in um, are because we have developed almost a muscle memory of how to deal with some of these things. Because um, what happened in 2003 is that we were impacted by SARS quite badly. And, and then after that, of course, there was um, the hand foot mouth disease. There was MERS. And Singapore, again, being a, a node in, in international travel, we tend to get exposed to a lot of these things. Um, I'll talk a little bit about international travel. Um, how that actually has an impact on how we think about uh, managing constraints around problems later on. So first, I want to talk a little bit about the lessons that we learned in 2003 because of SARS. Um, so SARS, of course, um, was coronavirus in a very, very early and less threatening form. Um, we know that coronavirus is a kind of, um, you know, um, it's a version of SARS because it's severely mutated, a lot more deadly, a lot more um, virile as a virus. Um, in, in 2003, though, you know, when the world had to deal with SARS, it was a, it's a very big problem. So um, there were some things that we did very well, which we've continued to do today. Now, um, Cognitive Edge is headquartered in Singapore. We share a strong relationship with the Singapore government. Um, we used to do compulsory training for the Singapore Civil Service in the Kinevin framework. So some of our emergency action planning um, actually utilizes the framework. So what we knew is that we had to um, do a lot of parallel safe to fail experiments because it's not a problem that we understand. It's new. A lot of it is emergent in nature. So we developed a whole bunch of, um, you know, things that we didn't know, you know, whether they would work. Um, I'll talk you through some of them. So one of them is actually uh, we created like a whole bunch of educational programs. Um, some of these are like local dramas, which dramatize, um, you know, what the healthcare frontline workers were actually going through in 2003. Um, and, and, you know, that through that type of narrative base um, storytelling, we were actually able to communicate some of the behavioral elements that needed to shift because of SARS, you know, back then, of course, SARS was problematic, but not quite as problematic as coronavirus. It wasn't, you know, um, so so infectious and airborne the way it's, it is now, but um, it, it was still problematic. So by conveying some of those problems um, to the public, the people actually could shift their behavior themselves. So instead of telling them directly what needed to be done, um, they actually self-policed because we were able to tell the story in an emotive way. Now that might sound quite familiar. Um, if you work in um, agile software development again, you know this is where this concept of user stories comes from. Um, um, how we adapted this uh, for the current coronavirus, um, nobody really watches local dramas in Singapore anymore. Uh, so instead of making new ones, they usually started to replay some of these old dramas uh, on a local network. And um, one of the things as well is to encourage people to stay at home. They gave um, everybody free access for a few months to network television. Uh, so that was one of the ways they improved um, people, you know, people's experiences staying home. Uh, the other thing that we did in uh, during SARS is actually the the government um, distributed thermometers to every single household, and they created collateral to teach people how to take their own temperature. Now, you know, that was um, a very cheap sort of um, intervention if you think about it for for a whole country the price of a single thermometer is very low to distribute it to every household as a preventive measure and this is again um, a complex uh, adaptive type of approach so instead of saying you know okay you have to come to the clinic we have to take your temperature is we're going to enable agents in the system to actually take action and self-police 
So we're actually, again, creating um, enabling constraints in the community. Again, uh, with SARS, you know, that, that worked. And then again, when hand, foot, mouth disease, MERS came along, um, thermometers could be reused. Of course, coronavirus is 17 years later. So some of those thermometers are not around anymore. But the other thing that is repeated, you know, that thermal scanning um, technology that you see in airports, that was actually a Singapore innovation. Uh, so the other thing that is very common in, in the complex domain, which is why a lot of um, innovation practitioners like to use it, is that um, we need to disrupt constraints to actually stimulate innovation. And a lot of innovation is actually radical repurposing. So this thermal imaging actually came from um, defense technology where they were using thermal imaging to scan for enemy movement in the dark. Um, currently, this is almost universal best practice because we have it in almost every um, airport across the world. Of course, uh, with coronavirus, they suddenly come into very strong use again. That's another one that's almost best practice. And, um, you know, we had these regular sort of um, conversations uh, during currently during coronavirus. These are actually live um, presentations by uh, members of the government. So this is actually our, our ex-minister of um, national development. Currently, he's the minister of education. So this replaced slightly, you know, the, the more dramatization um, of, of SARS, because I think that in this day and age, people crave a more, um, you know, in-person consultative approach. So just to um, walk you through, what we did is actually we, we trial and experimented with a bunch of stuff. And some of them worked well. And because some of them worked well, we explored enough and we knew that, OK, you know, this is good practice or this is best practice. We can begin to exploit it, you know, and, and that's why some of the practices that worked really well in SARS, we could actually very easily move over. They, they actually provided, you know, that type of easy move over to combat other viruses that came about after that. Um, very, very selectively do we apply rigid structure. Um, to them. So the only example I can think of is the thermal imaging software in um, machines, sorry, in every airport worldwide. Uh, the problem, though, is uh, a lot of times people want to push everything into the other domains because they want to exploit, they want to scale. Without stabilization, we cannot scale. But um, once we try to scale or we try to actually exploit too early, what happens is we, we almost stop scanning. And scanning is extremely critical in complex environments. Um, if you stop scanning, you actually stop um, detecting weak signals. And weak signal detection is really critical. I'll show you a weak signal that we did not pick up. Um, so one of the problems that caused our coronavirus <laughs> numbers to explode uh, suddenly was there was an outbreak of coronavirus in foreign worker dormitories. Uh, Singapore is heavily reliant on foreign workers. We have a large population of them. Um, uh, very ashamed to say they have not been housed in the best conditions. You know, you, this is a typical dormitory. You can tell there isn't space to social distance. So what happened is this was a problem that they wanted to ignore. You know, we've, people have been talking about the fact that this is not the right living condition and they chose to ignore it. So it was a signal they, they didn't want to pick up. And of course, the problem exploded. So this is where we did not do very well. Um, some of, again, the acceptation, the rapid repurposing, right? What we, what we tried to do then was to find ways to house them in a manner that allowed them to social distance. So this is actually a floating hotel that typically is used for people who work out on these oil rigs. And these oil rigs, um, you know, they need people to mend them all the time. And these hotels were actually repurposed to, to house and quarantine people. So this is another example of rapid repurposing. Um, just to talk about constraint management, um, you know, in different domains, you have different types of constraints. Uh, in the audit domains, right, what you'll find is more rigid constraints. Um, and uh, one of these examples are, for example, uh, medical care, who you give medical care to. In Singapore, when we first started, we promised medical care to everybody. Uh, what happened is we had a lot of people coming in from other countries, and then we restricted that to only medical care for um, residents. Uh, we had other type of constraints. Um, one of them is actually this concept of a, a dark constraint. Right. So how do you actually stimulate the right type of behavior? We actually reported 
um, who got the virus and how on a daily basis. So this is the level of detail we gave, um, not personally identifying, but enough information to know who these people are. And although this seems confronting, what this does is that it personalizes the cases. So it's no longer just some, you know, Jane Doe or some John Doe who got it. It was a person, she had a life. And that's what we call um, dark constraints is that we then start policing each other because we have to take care of each other. So um, that's what we refer to as an enabling constraint. So I've only got two minutes left, so I'm going to stop here. Um, but I've gone really quickly um, into Kinevin. I've talked a little bit, the dynamics, a little bit about some of the constraints as well. So um, Pooja. Yeah, yeah I, I just kind of joined in to <laughs> say that we are just about to reach time. So uh, yeah, we have a couple of minutes, like two minutes okay. left. We can probably take one question. So um, uh, anyone has questions, you can type in chat section or Q&A section and Zen can answer them. Uh, please feel free to use that. Or do you think that this framework uh, utilizing this framework can help in your work. Uh, give us thumbs up so that Zane knows that uh, it's something, uh, there's something interesting about it. Hmm, this is the identity with virtual platform. <laughs> we don't know if you are listening to us. Uh, I'm going to pretend that you are. Thank you very much. <laughs> No, no, people are really listening. Okay. Thank you. The count is increasing now. Yeah, so you, yeah, any any questions, uh, Q&A section, I don't see any um, in the chat. No questions? I, I mean, I'll just give a little plug. Kinevin has is turning twenty one next month, and we've got a you know as every culture has a coming of age ritual, we're planning a whole series of Kinevin events. So we're calling it Kinevin twenty one twenty one days of Kinevin. So if you're interested, um, you know uh, the the name is 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 spelt in 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 the top right C Y N E F I N. It is a Welsh word. So if you're interested, uh, do Google that Kinevin 21 and, and join us to find out more about it. Yeah. So yeah, so, yeah uh, thanks, uh, Zain, for uh, bringing this topic forward. And I particularly am going to read about it and understand more in detail. Uh, thank you so much for your time and uh, coming here and sharing with us. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Enjoy. Yeah.